Corporation is a all volunteer nonprofit organization that is committed not only to the restoration of the depot, the signal tower, expanding our operations here in the park, but also it's an educational organization. We maintain and share a written and oral history of railroads in Hopewell Junction. A number of things that we've done in the past is we provide tours for senior groups, um, middle school students, day-to-day um, -day tours of the facilities themselves. This program this afternoon is an expansion on that. Where we'd like to educate not only ourselves, but get our first-hand knowledge and share it with you of what it was like to ride the rails in the 60s, early 70s on the Hobo Depot, um, excuse me, on the New Haven Railroad. We'd like you to hold any questions to the end of the converse, or end of the presentation so we can let the two gentlemen get through their, their programs and, and their um, experiences. With that all said, uh, I'd like to introduce John Desmond, a recent board member, and he'll take you through who these gentlemen are and take you through how the program will run for the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, again, it's a nice afternoon. Yesterday I wondered whether this would actually take place when it was rain and cold and wind. Uh, what we have here are three gentlemen who have very graciously um, agreed to come this afternoon. The fellow who's picking up the paper for me here is Pete McLaughlin and pencil, and, pencil, uh, and Pete McLaughlin. Uh, next to him, standing up in the blue jacket, is Jack Swanberg, and then Tom De Joseph is at the end. All um, Pete and Jack ran trains through. Um, Hotel Junction, coming from the yards in, in uh, New Haven, all the way through Danbury, and then up here to Hopewell, on up to Poughkeepsie, across the Poughkeepsie Highland Railroad Bridge, and on the Maybrook. Tom De Joseph worked here as a station agent. So what we'd like to do here is, here they've all agreed to talk in terms of seniority. So I guess the first person we're going to talk, listen to is Pete McLaughlin, and Pete is going to explain his experiences on the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad um, beginning in 1950, 1959. So without further ado, uh, let's hear from Pete. And as Dave mentioned, any questions you may have for Pete, later Jack, and eventually Tom, um, we we'll ask you to hold to the end and then allow you to uh, address those questions to the individual. <laughs> Thanks again, and Pete, we welcome you. Well, with that applause, I quit. <laughs> uh, thank you for having me be here. And I have to say before I start, the people involved in this Hopewell Junction Station development are miracle workers. Years ago, we used to call this hopeless junction because the building would have last rights. But getting back here, <clears throat> my experiences at Hopewell Junction were 90% going east and west by here at 50 miles an hour. However, we would have some work trains that would lay over here. We would go to wait for clearance. I do remember Mrs. Cooper, who was here as an agent operator. But my biggest memory here is... After there were no operators agents that were sitting inside the uh, station waiting to get clearance back to Danbury, and Mr. Fred Palmer drove up. He was train master. He came in with a large cardboard box. It contained S.S. Pierce sandwiches. Get rid of me quick. S.S. Pierce sandwiches that he gave us to eat. 
So my last memory of Hopewell Junction is eating sandwiches. But uh, we did not do much here, but we would go by coming off the hill behind us. We would uh, kick the air off around the bridge back there and just roll through here at 50. Coming uh, west to east, we had the throttle in the eighth notch trying to make a run for the hill. Um, it was quite an experience. Uh, I did not, uh, I did work between here and Beacon a lot under Penn Central, but we did have some good times here. I've been quizzed about the interior, and I really honestly cannot remember completely about the interior. Uh, but Mrs. Cooper, I do remember, she was a very fine lady, and uh, we all respected her very much. Uh, at that time, we did not have women and crews. Of course, today we do have women engineers, conductors, etc. No problem. Hopewell Junction is a big historic site, and we do C&E tours every year, and we've been here. But uh, coming back to running through here <clears throat> on trains. Basically, uh, east to west, we would have 150 cars because mostly empties. Now, coming down the grade from homes, if you had uh, did not have dynamic brake on your locomotive, that was a feature that turned the traction motors in reverse to hold back your train. If you only had air, you had to come down the hill differently. <clears throat> When you had air, as you crest the hill at Holmes, you would get going at about 30, 35 miles an hour, and you would take uh, five or six pounds off your train line air. That would hold your train back in what we called power braking. You'd be in about the fourth notch pulling your train down the hill because you did not want to use the air uh, Breaking because you use the air on and off, you'll have no air. So we would go down the hill about 30, 35 miles an hour. And then as we hit the bridge back there with the coal pot, you'd kick off the air. And like I say, we'd wind through here about 50 miles an hour. You stayed at high speed till about Manchester Bridge. Then you had to really start setting your train up for the Poughkeepsie Bridge. Uh, the Kipsey Bridge is not a level bridge. It wasn't when we had it. It had a hump in it. But Hopewell Junction, uh, like I said, my experiences aren't that much here. That'll be like Tom, the Joseph experience he actually worked here. But going over the Kipsey Bridge is, by the way, and going over that bridge since 1953. Uh, okay, sorry. Hope he's not dropping bombs. I will never walk that bridge. You will never catch me walking that bridge. It's too high. Now, going over on a train was absolutely no problem for me. Uh, I've taken many a photo off the bridge from a train, never walking. So, uh, I was over there a couple of weeks ago taking photos, a Highland police officer talking to me. He was going to arrest me, put me in handcuffs, and drag my body over the bridge. But no good. The Kipsey Bridge, uh, we were not allowed to use train or engine or train brake at all on the bridge. You could use your engine brake for holding your train back. But no, so now as you came down to the bridge, you had your freight cars on air. You would kick off the air so as each car was reaching the bridge, the brakes would be released. We were allowed uh, seven and a half minutes, no more than 12 miles an hour. That's that's the whole train. So you had to watch it. They had three clocks on the bridge, clocks that would time us. They had to come to get the tape. It wasn't computerized. The bridge also had watchmen that would have to walk every half hour or behind every train. And they would be there. You're going over the bridge at two in the morning, Howling blizzard, there they are walking. They had three clocks they had to punch in. Um, so you pull your train off and go. Now, now if you had uh, dynamic braking, which the engine could reverse its traction motors to hold it, that was better. You'd hold your train back, 
with your engines and then kick the train brake off as you approach the bridge. There's more detail to this, but it's just the basics of how to run. Like I say, my running through Hopo is 50 miles an hour each way, except when I heard they had sandwiches. I, <laughs> I stopped. But uh, the, uh, the project here is truly amazing. I mean, I've seen restorations around, but this had to be the fastest. Bernie Redenberg was a fine man. He was determined to get the station built, and by God, he did. You know, then when I heard they were going to put the tower up, my God, it was up before I heard it. So be very happy with this hopeful junction. This, this whole area is lined with history. Uh, the Hopewell Inn, we got many a sandwich out of that when we had a work train here. Uh, then when we started running from Beacon up to here to go to New Haven, coming off the Hudson Division was one of the hardest pulls you could have on a train. Because remember, we go off at track level and we cross over the track about a quarter mile down. So you're grinding up here like mad. When you came out of Beacon, you're either going to make it or not, but if you got the engines up to about where Interstate 84 was, you could make it. Now, at Beacon, they had something I had never seen before. If you stalled coming out of Beacon, with the dispatch, they let you back the whole train down and try again. I had never seen that anywhere else on a railroad. But, of course, that's all gone now, too. Um, so I'm not going to hold you up. Uh, about Hopewell because you've heard basically my experiences. I will turn the next microphone over to Mr. Swanberg, who was also a New Haven Railroad employee with me for a while. Jack? Hey, you want a question? Okay. All right, Mr. Rass, I started in New Haven as a fireman, locomotive fireman in 1961. And I worked there for about a year, and then, of course, there was a draft out there, so I went into naval aviation for Florida. Came back and worked for New Haven as a fireman for just a month or two to work on the new power, which I had never worked on while I was away, which they purchased while I was gone. Then I went into a management trainee program on New York Central. From then on, I was, I've been a manager as a train master, as Pete, Pete says, and so on. So I did not run the trains like Pete did. I was a fireman on them. I just ran occasionally, but I'll show you the engines we've had uh, when I got here. If you could pass this around, we had, we had a the 400 series diesel engines. They're alpha, built by alpha up in Schenectady, New York. And they, overnight, they replaced the steam engines on this line in 1947. Usually you'd run them in four unit sets. With a streamlined, this is back in the streamlined era, so you'd have a streamlined A unit, two B units, and then another streamlined A unit. And they're all operated from the head end. Sometimes they have five units. The fireman, the fireman title dated from steam locomotive days when there was a fire. So you're saying, well, what does a fireman do on a diesel? Well, if a diesel is new and it's working right, he doesn't do a, a whole lot. But by the time I was working on these, 1961, they've been here since 1947, and the Haven uh, was bankrupt. And they, didn't, they weren't as shiny as they are in that picture. And, and they were, in effect, falling apart. And if you're coming up the grade, like out of here going east, uh, they'd start to overheat. And you, you're in the head engine, because the, all the engines are controlled for the head engine, but you've got an alarm bell system. So you're going along, and the alarm bells start ringing. Well, the fireman goes back and to find out which unit is screwed up. And it usually be second, third unit, whatever, would be overheating. And unless you stop it from overheating, it's going to shut down. I have only got three units instead of four, might not make the hill. So the objective is to, everything was supposed to be automatic. The shutters open, the fan turns on for the radiator, all that. Well, it didn't work anymore. So you'd have to bleed off the air of the shutters, take a hammer, typical railroad, hammer something, and hammer the, the, the dog open, and then dog it down to keep the shutters open. Then you'd go over and figure out all the controls uh, were erased when the paint was gone, how to get the fan working as fast by looking at the shaft with your flashlight. All this basic stuff. And you'd get to the top of the grade, if you made it, which you always did, but uh, get the top of the grade, now you're going along and they'd start to get too cold. So you'd have to go back and reverse the procedure. 
So on, on the sawtooth grade, like the paper plan, you're doing this three or four times, and say if you have five units, maybe three of them are going to require some attention. So the fireman actually did do some work, even though there was no fire. But when I came back and they had the new locomotives, 1966, those were brand new. So then the fireman, he, he ran part of the time, but there was nothing nothing to reset, really, because they were a new locomotive. So, and of course, later on, they eliminated the firemen altogether. But when I got back here in 66, I, I had five years seniority by then, so I could hold a regular job to Bayville. That was N09, N being New Haven, O being Mayville, in the symbol book. So normally, we'd come up to homes that Pete mentioned, and then we'd get to the west end of the siding there, and we'd have a red signal, because there's a train coming up the grade the other way. And that happened almost every run. And I noticed that um, over in the swamp, that this was called Reynolds, you know, right at the top of the summit, in the swamp by the signal, there was an old sign down in the swamp, wooden sign that said Reynolds on it. It wasn't in use anymore, but it had just fallen into the swamp. I took a look at it, because we're waiting for another train. Needed a special kind of wrench to get it off the post. So the next one brought the wrench, we got stopped again, went over there and took it off, and put it on the engine. Of course, it's called the Maybrook. But, so I had to bring it over to the Maybrook YMCA, put it in my room with me that night, and then the next day put it on the engine, back to the Maybrook, take it along to Newtown. And it's Reynolds, it's the top of the hill from here, it's right next to you guys, so I figure you ought to have it. So, Tom, if you can bring that sign over, oh, there it is. Yeah, that's the Reynolds Summit sign, mm -hmm. and I am presenting that to the uh, Hopewell Depot, because that's where it ought to be. But as I say, I left engine service in 66, went into management from then on, and I, I, I let's see, it was New York Central was the railroad I went into management, but it was still a separate railroad before all the mergers. Then in, uh, I was out in Detroit for years, I finally was able to get back here. Meanwhile, it became Penn Central in 68. It became Conrail in 76. And where I was working with New Haven became Metro North in 83. So I worked for five railroads, and I retired from Metro North in 2000 as the lead train master of New Haven. Thank you very much. Um, so, like Jack and, and he, uh, I, I came here in 1968 to this station, um, and I, I was here for a few weeks and I left and I never came back. <laughs> and I came back about eight or nine months ago, and I mentioned to this young lady over here with the dark hair that I actually worked here. And, I had people swarming all over me. <laughs> um, I've been in the railway industry for 50 years. I'm still working. And, uh, but in 1968, you know, I was young. I was 18 years old, and I was working for the New York Monday Department. And I had qualified as an, as an agent operator. I started in Danbury. And I got a call from Mary Sullivan one day, and Mary was the, she was the lady in New Haven who took care of us, or the agent operator, and she said to me, I need you to go to Hopewell Junction. And I was like, yeah, okay, where is that? <laughs> and so I found out, and uh, I came over to Hopewell Junction to what they call post for a job, and that basically, gave you an opportunity to work on a job under someone else's mentorship till, you, till they felt that you could handle the job and then they could go away on vacation. <laughs> so I came over here and met Mrs. Cooper. And but back then, and again, this is, I'm not being sexist, but back then you just didn't expect to see a lady out in a station uh, like this. And she really was a lady. She was a really great lady. She took me under her wing, taught me what I needed to know, and 
and you know, you turn the clock back and you say, you're 18 years old, and now you learn how to go to a customer and say, give me a check. I want a cashier's check because you've got a carload of grain or a carload of lumber or something like that out here that you need to pay for before you can take ownership of the material. And so for somebody who's 18, you're learning this stuff. She gave me a little bit of background in, in business and some of the stuff that went on here. So after about a week, uh, Mrs. Cooper said, I'm leaving on vacation. And I, it, it was probably the first vacation she had had in about four years. Hopo was not in the center of the New Haven Railroad. Interestingly, there, this was just an agency. There wasn't any operational work that the station agent did. In most other agencies, you had a signal system, a block system, a, uh, where you actually wrote out train orders and wrote out clearance forms and this kind of stuff. Here, it wasn't that way. Basically, you dealt with the customers that were in the area. Uh, I can remember a winery uh, uh, across the, uh, I think it was in Cannondale or something like that, across the river. Some uh, lumber companies here, Williams Lumber. There was also a, uh, uh, a testing lab, a research lab at Texaco down on the Beacon Branch. And, and the, so these folks were the railroad's customers. And so you dealt with them on the cars that were coming in, where they were going to be spotted. Uh, you gave that information to the conductor on the local. Now, the local was NX-9. And NX-9 came out of Poughkeepsie in the morning and came over, worked uh, worked on the uh, on the other side of the bridge, came over here. Uh, I'm trying to think of the fellows. I think the fellow's name was Charlie May that I remember was the conductor. And they would come in and they would, they would we'd go through the paperwork together, what they were going to do, and then they would leave and go down the Beacon Branch. So the Beacon Branch back then, as I recall, was in yard limits. And so they didn't need any operational um, passage uh, paperwork to get down on the Beacon Branch. They were just able to go down on the Beacon Branch working under yard limits, which meant that they couldn't exceed 15 miles an hour. They had to be prepared to stop and proceed, uh, stop at the switch on line and properly lined or obstruction on the track. So it was relatively slow speed, but there was some business down there. There was also some business right here in, in, uh, in Hopewell. I think Williams Lumber may still be here. I'm not sure, but they were a customer back then. Um, but one of the most interesting stories was that I can remember standing out one day, and I think it was uh, CB2 was coming through, which was an area like the one New Haven, uh, Chicago, Boston train. It was a hot shot train. And uh, so we heard CB2 was coming, and so I said, well, you know, I'm going to go out and stand, up, stand over here. CB2 is flying by, and there used to be a signal up here somewhere just, just – east of the station, and the signal went red in the engineer's face, and he dumped the air. I, I don't know how fast they went in this direction, people, but he was he was moving pretty good. And, 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 and man, I'll tell you, if you've never heard a train go into emergency, it's a, it's a, you don't want to do it. You don't want to hear a train go into emergency, because there was squeaking and screeching, and, uh, and the engineer came into the station and got on the phone, and he was screaming at the dispatcher to own the signal on red in his face. It was, uh, again, you're talking about a kid who was here, 18 years old, uh, first real job. Railroading is fascinating. It is, uh, I talk to young people's groups all the time now, college kids, and this guy's kind of helping how fascinating this industry is because people don't understand how technologically advanced the industry is. There's so many different things that we do that are on the leading edge of technology. Uh, we move 40% of the nation's goods. People always think about, oh, it's a railroad, steam engine, blah, blah, blah. I can remember my dad. Dad, I'm going to work for the New Haven Railroad. Why are you going to work for a bankrupt company? There are no good. There won't be any railroads here in 10 years. And here it is 50 years later, and I'm still at it. <laughs> um, so I really think that you folks have done an absolutely phenomenal job. This station... <laughs> well, we do 
was hopeless junction when I was here, for sure. Uh, there was a bathroom in there, though. I did not have to go outside to go to the bathroom. And I think they probably did that for Mrs. Cooper, if, if not for anybody else. That was, unfortunately, I don't remember a lot about it. It was 50 years ago, and it was my first. I, that whole summer, I worked at different stations uh, covering covering vacations. I started here at Hopewell. I was at New Milford. I was at Lee, Massachusetts. I was at Canaan. I was at Newtown. So I was all over the place on New Haven back then. But uh, appreciate the opportunity to come, and I'll be more than happy, like all these fine gentlemen, to, to answer any questions you have. But thanks again for, for taking care of this. Thank you. <laughs> okay, folks, um, I think at this point here we'll do uh, any question answers, and uh, because we have a microphone here that is picking up the taping, um, each uh, 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 Pete and Jack and Tom will stand up here and answer any individual questions you may have. So I'm going to hand the microphone back over to Pete, and uh, if you have any questions or comments you'd like to make to him, uh, this would be a good time to do it. So the question was, coming out of Maybrook, how fast did you have to go to approach the bridge? Uh, coming out of Maybrook, the track was pretty good, straight. Uh, you could get up to 50, except for a place called Gaffney's Curve. It's west of May, uh, Highland. It's where the New York State Light and Power Company have a big yard. We're coming toward... Boy, my parents wish I had one that didn't work. <laughs> you start um, downgrade. I mean, you go right downgrade toward Highland and the bridge. So again, if you had not dynamic braking, which is a uh, traction motor is a pull the diesel, you can reverse it so the traction motors are holding the diesel back against the train. But with air, again, at a point you would put about, oh, I put about six to ten pounds of air on for the train, holding the engine brake off. So you pull your train down to about, I'm going to say about 12, 15 miles an hour, at about, these are just rough guesses from memory, about an eighth of a mile you kick off your train brake, put your engine brake on to hold the train. You hit the bridge, hopefully at about 12 miles an hour, not 40. And as you're going on the bridge, your freight car brakes are releasing. It is against the rules to use any freight car braking on the bridge. So once you get the air off, you're holding it back with your engine, then there was a little hump. Don't ask me why. So then as you're going on the bridge, you start releasing the engine brake because you're now on the bridge fairly level. Then you start notching out to stretch your train slack because at the other end of the bridge was a grade up. And the last thing you want to do on a freight train on the Bikiki Bridge is stall or break it in two. So by the time you get toward the Poughkeepsie end, you're probably in the fifth or sixth notch because you're starting up grade. Mind you, the whole train has to stay at 12 miles an hour. And you would just work your throttle as you get off. Now, we had no uh, foot wires, but the telegraph pulls that. We figured three freight cars per pull. And you would estimate, out of Maybrook, you probably had 95 to maybe 120 cars because they're mostly loads. Uh, and then you would just come figure you're off the bridge and wide open. Bring your thing right up. By the time you went over Manchester Bridge, you're doing 40, 45, 50. And as I said, through here, 50. But now you're running for the grade. And you may go by here at 50, but a little ways past Stormville, which, by the way, had a nice deli then. We'd stop at on a work train. You're down to about 15, 20 miles an hour up the whole grade. It was a pull. Now, speaking of that, about 1960, the New Haven tried an experiment. They took off the fourth diesel 
and, and put a pusher service out of here. I owned the job as a fireman for a while, but it wasn't really out of here. We reported at Danbury at 3.15 a.m., came over here light, and we would push every train up the hill. And we were busy. There was a lot of train. ON2, OB6, advance. And we'd push up the hill. Well, after about a month, the New Haven decided they would add on the fourth unit. So technically, I more or less, Joe McGoldrick, Emmett Barrett, conduct owned the last pusher out of here, but we reported in Danbury. 16 hours a day, seven days a week. I was much younger. But that's the way railroading was. You, The railroad was your life. But getting back to uh, Poughkeepsie, so now once we got out past Poughkeepsie, put the throttle in the eighth notch and just highball through here. I'm saying 50, I might have gone faster through here or not, I don't know. Because about a mile from here, you're down to 10, 15 miles an hour and crawling, digging for speed. You put the sanders on, which by the way, locomotives have a pipe, even today, in front of every driving wheel, you see a pipe that blows sand on the rail for traction. That started in about 1870 and is still built on the most modern locomotives today. Wow. So get up the hill and we would go. Coming down the bridge, the same thing. The, uh, go down there and they had the clocks. You couldn't cheat because they took the clocks twice a week and we had a tape they would go. So they knew what you did. They had the same thing on the hill from Botsford, Connecticut to Derby. Three clocks that timed us. Um, you know, so but today it's all electronic. So running over the Poughkeepsie Bridge, was t you couldn't talk, you could not pay attention. One slip, you'd have two trains. And that's the last thing they want to do is break a train in two in the middle of the Poughkeepsie Bridge. Then the bridge then, why I would never walk it now, my memory of the bridge is railing that was rotted, wouldn't hold a sparrow, planks that were loose falling down in front of you, and straight down 212 feet. Our biggest game was coming on the bridge is what rain barrel would start dancing first because it was loose. Yet the watchmen were there. Two, three in the morning, rain, snow. There they were walking. They either had to be drunk, on drugs, or completely brainless. But they, were good. they wouldn't take a ride. If you could go slow, let's get on. No, we got to walk. And that's where the end of the bridge was. Penn Central came in. People say Penn Central started the bridge on fire. No, they set it up. First thing they did was take the watchman off the bridge. Now, if you're ever walking a track anywhere, you see ties that are smoking. It's from the steel against steel. Well, that's what the watchmen were for on the bridge. So they took them off. They did away with the fire alarms and let the hoses freeze up. So there's the end of any protection. So they didn't like the match, but they put it there. The last train over, I think it was any 74 with all, and Brett Driscoll was the engineer, Sammy Christiana was the conductor. And uh, the last train over, Sammy was on the caboose at the flag, the conductor. His claim to fame was he was the last paid employee over the bridge. And technically he was. But uh, the bridge, you had to pay attention. You could not be talking to your conductor because, like I said, the same as coming out of Beacon. Beacon was one hell of a place to come out with with a heavy train. You just go there. You could not get up speed because you're crossing over from the Penn Central Main Line and it had a hell of a curve that would bind your train. But, uh, remember, a quarter mile where we left the track, we're going over the same track, climbing up to here. It's a heavy grade to think about. So now you would go, there was a, a cupcake crossing there. We would, if you stall, you're blocking the crossing for the factory. But as I said earlier, I've never been anywhere else and let the whole freight train back down, get on the main and try again. Once you got up to the Interstate 84, you're gonna make it. And pulling through here, we had a 20 mile an hour restriction over the Y, and again, you make a run for the hill. Um, it was fun. I loved being an engineer. It was promoted in 1965. Started on the railroad at 18 in 1956 as an engine preparer. 
servicing electric freight engines, etc. Uh, when I was old enough, they asked me if I wanted to go firing. Well, that's like asking anybody you want a free meal. So I went. I was very lucky. I was supposed to go to college. That went out the window. But it was an excellent career. I worked with uh, Jack and I were on the railroad many years at the same time. I don't believe it was more than four or five times we came together under pay at the same time. He was Metro North. I was New Haven, Penn Central, Conrail. But he had time to chew my tail out, though. So that's about it. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, my question uh, is back goes back to 1967, 1968, the last two years for the New Haven. Uh, it's about the United Aircraft turbotrains that were the first two sets that were built in Chicago, and they were delivered to New Haven, Connecticut. Can you or Jack verify that those trains came over the Maybrook line? Off the Erie Lackawanna at Campbell Hall when they were delivered. Tom and I could both verify that. Uh, we've got photos of them at Danbury. You do have, I've in. never seen photos of any of those oh, trains on the Maybrook. We had them. Danbury News Times had those, and yeah. we took photos, Tom and I. Tom was the agent at Danbury at the time, and they came through twice, not the same time. Right. When they were first delivered, uh, they, mostly they had no seats in them, it was all test equipment inside of them. Well, I don't and then know. I read they were sent back to Chicago oh, where they, they were, were fitted out. Forth, yeah. They were when fitted they out with all the seats. red, white, and blue, we called them the flying toothpaste. Right. Tooth. But they did, they did go back and forth on yes, the Maybrook line. Now, okay. they had an interesting feature. Uh, you could ride them. They had like a dome. And I don't and know if Tom was you were riding. And you could see the engineer and fireman ahead of you from right. the glass. Right. Well, later on, a fireman bid them in from Boston. Uh, he wore, he was about heavy set, almost 350 pounds, but he wore clothes that would fit him when he was six years old. After his back, back side was facing the public, he was asked to go back to freight service. But we call that the flying toothpaste tube. Okay. Any other questions before I turn it over? Yes, Joe. How about the, the pusher uh, story? The what? Your pusher story. The Berkshire story? Pushers. Oh, Pusher story, yeah. Uh, it was here. You mean out of here, yeah. Yeah. I was the uh, last fireman on a... Well, I can't, can't say it was out of here because we reported at Danbury, ran like hell over here light to catch Owen 2 that reported at the same time in Maybrook. And we spent the... We had Owen 2, uh, OB6, advanced OB2, OB2 and OB4 to push plus extras. So for 16 hours, we hardly said, if we had time, the dispatcher would let us go back to Poughkeepsie and Table Talk Pie had an outlet there. That was our lunch, <laughs> supper, and breakfast, Table Talk Pie. But it was a good job. Emmett Barrett was a conductor. Joe McGoldrick was the engineer. Now, I think Joe's referring to, we would sit here and the eastbound would go by and stop. We would couple, never now, no radios. We would couple on and we would push up the hill. One day we were up at Holmes going back down to get, I'm going to say OB6. And the dispatcher said OB6 did not stop at Hopewell. He's making a run for the hill. Stay at Holmes and go down and pull him up when he stalls. And sure enough, they stalled. So I've got slides of going down a couple on his nose. We usually push from the rear. So they had to go to an investigation. We had to go to, and this is when the New Haven was a railroad. Superintendent, they're talking to us, and he asked the engine crew, he said to the engineer, Rudy Fredericks, uh, why did you stall? And he said, it's right away where he says, you stalled because you couldn't make the hill. Don't tell me an engine failed or this is. He says, I was an engineer. I pulled every same excuse myself. He says, you know what you did wrong. You've lost a day's pay coming in here. The pusher crew will get paid for the day. And he says, that's all I'm going to give you, except we got to go down now to the lobby of the station, and you got to buy me coffee. That was it. But they still had to go. So we had to pull them up the hill. Very red-faced engineer, I want to tell you that. But the pusher was it, and after about a month, the New Haven decided that three units 
was not equal to putting the fourth unit on for expense. So that was the last pusher. We had an RS3 Alco, and there's a book, on, on Barney, Bernie Redenberg's book, unfortunately, no fault to him, but I blame Nersha, the New Haven Historic Society, shows a photo I took off an RS3 out here. OB6 is coming, and the caption reads, the pusher is getting ready to push. We were not the pusher. We were a local freight out of Danbury sent here with a hot car for the hospital. The pusher always faced the other way. Nursia gave that information out to everybody wrong, because I gave them the right. But anyway, the next slide I took is the pusher going by us. For what they didn't even mention, the train in the picture coming, the third unit was a Boston and Maine Railroad cab unit. So, but that's it. Any other questions? Okay. I will. No, I'm not available tonight. <laughs> I was just wondering if any of you gentlemen knew any of the signal station operators that were on the end of the Poughkeepsie Railroad Bridge. My father worked there from, I don't know exactly, <laughs> it's been a long time, uh, in the 50s to maybe 62 or 3. Um, lots of times, though, he worked, I don't remember because I was only a kid. Uh, whether it was 4 to 12 or or um, 3 to 11. But anyway, uh, I just wondered if any of you knew any of the operators. His name was Fred Thompson. Did they what? That? Say that again? Fred Thompson. Fred Thompson. He worked no. in the signal station on the east end of the railroad bridge. Mm -hmm. Doesn't ring a bell. Okay. Probably a maintainer, though. Yeah, they had signal maintainers that walked. No, he was in the station. All right, well, now, Poughkeepsie Station. No. CTC the line. No, the signal station at the end of the, at the east end of the bridge. Well, they had signals at both ends of the bridge, yes. I know that. Yeah. But anyway, the first CTC panel was in the Poughkeepsie Station. It was a small panel like this, and the New Haven was kind of unique. When they put in CTC, any other the dispatcher operated the CTC. Under the New Haven, they still had an operator with the dispatcher sitting next to him to run the CTC machine. There was a panel above all the. Uh, yeah. All right. You're talking a track panel. Yes. Yes. And yeah. could, the light would come on. So yeah, that was also know. in Poughkeepsie Station. Where the train was. Yeah, it was in Poughkeepsie. Right. I remember that. And I was under the impression that trains had to slow down at five. Maybe that was just westbound. Well, westbound. Well, they had. I missed the semaphore signals, and they had changed the signaling. In fact, when I came on, the whole Maybrook line was double iron Poughkeepsie to Devon or, or Derby Junction. Now, another thing that I read about the Maybrook line. The Maybrook line ended not in New Haven. It ended at Derby, Connecticut. Because at Derby, Connecticut, you crossed over onto the Naugatuck Division, and that was the Naugatuck. If you're coming out at Maybrook to New Haven, you're on track two. You go through Derby Junction without changing tracks, you're on track one. Very complicated. But any other questions before I turn it over? Where was the Poughkeepsie Station you're talking about? Our Poughkeepsie Station was on the east end of the bridge, about, oh, i got to say 600 feet past the, uh, the switch for Smith Street. There was a switch there down the Smith Street. Okay. Now, after the fire, uh, when we come out of Smith Street Bridge, if we had more than six or, or, yeah, more than six or seven cars, we'd open a gate. This is after the fire on the Poughkeepsie Bridge, and we were allowed to back out up to 10 car lengths on the bridge to clear the switch at Smith Street switch to head uh, east on the Maybrook. So technically there was a last train over the bridge, 
I don't want to how technical you want to get, but was it the last train on the bridge? May I'll let them say the chicken or the egg first. May 8th, Any other questions? It's right about where we're going over the Hudson Pass. Um, no. Yeah. I'm sorry. No. no. I see no future for anything yes. on the Maybrook line. There's no industry. All this talk about pasture service is how to air that in the Hindenburg. <laughs> All these studies about pasture service, they don't even know where to study. When somebody tells you that they could have a million riders between Danbury and Pittsfield, I don't know what they're smoking. Uh, <laughs> Also, we went to a small burg. We got 3,000 signatures going to ride. I was at New Milford last year, and I toured two state representatives part. I said, you're talking about 50 riders out of New Milford. How many are you going to pull off the Harlem line? You're talking about a layout yard in the middle. No, you dead had the I could go on, but no. I'm sorry to say, unless a tourist railroad comes on, but I see no commercial future for this line at all. All right, I'll turn it over now to Mr. Swanberg. Somebody wake him up. <laughs> well, well, Pete, you thought uh, put me to sleep. <laughs> I don't know if anybody has any questions. Pete really covered the waterfront. One thing I might say is, if you're not a road man, CPC, you just talk about, that means centralized traffic control. They get rid of the individual towers and so on. It's a little saving device, and they put that in here. It's about 1960 or so on the, on the Maybrook line when they, when they single tracked it. They, could, they first controlled it locally, but they ended up controlling everything from New Haven. But then also, you mentioned the domes on the turbos. There were also these western trains, you've probably seen pictures and so on, that had the glass top dome cars for scenery. And the question is, did those ever operate through here? And to my knowledge, they operated twice. The uh, GM made a train of tomorrow after World War II, 1947, that had dome cars in it, and that demonstrated all around the country because they were just, just starting to build faster equipment again after the war. And it was still thought that there was a lot of business in the future. It, it ended up drying up. But that train came in over the Baybrook line, across the Poughkeepsie Bridge, right through Hopewell Junction to New Haven with, with dome cars. The only other time, Conrail in 1990, ran a Constitution State special with their private train for their executives. That came through here with a Santa Fe dome car that Conrail had purchased. And it went uh, Danbury, Raven, Danbury, Hopewell. But then it went down to Beacon Branch, to Beacon. And that's the only time there's ever been a dome car in the Beacon Branch, as far as I know. And I was on that because I was a train master at the time. So nobody even asked that question, but that's the answer. Uh, does anybody else have any real questions? Uh, the Conrail Dome car you're talking about was car number 55. Uh, I rode in that car along with all the other cars uh, when Conrail ran a Operation Lifesaver on the West Shore from Selkirk down to Newburgh and back. And, uh, and the GM train of tomorrow that you're talking about, I have black and white photographs of that train in Smith Street Yard in Poughkeepsie on public display uh, when it was open for the public to go through the train. And what year What year was that? 1947. 47, because the photos I have have no dates on them that show the train in Smith Street Yard. Yes, it demonstrated all over the country, and it, it went to places like that that never even saw a passenger train by yeah. then. And it ended up being bought by the Union Pacific Railroad. Yes, the entire train was sold to the Union Pacific, yes. Anything else? I wanted to tell you, the fellow sitting next to me is one of our tour guides, and his name is Jim Reynolds, and he thanks you for the sign. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not mine. Reynolds, yeah, so you can put it, you can put it on your house. <laughs> the, the Reynolds sign was actually later Reynoldsville Summit, correct? Yeah, we called it Reynoldsville Summit, and the sign, by the time I started working, the sign was no longer there. It was down in the swamp. Yeah, but I mean, the location was, what was it before or after that it was called Reynoldsville Summit in the employee timetables? I'm not sure. Do you know what it was called? In the, because Holmes was the east end of that summit. Right, correct. But yeah. the west end was just an automated 
signal, and I don't know, was that in the timetable? Yeah, I don't remember it having a, we all, called, we, we all called it Reynoldsville Summit, but uh, there was no sign there saying that. The sign that I uh, had was down in the swamp long since out of service. But, uh, I, you know, I, I'd like to take souvenirs, so I'm not going to take a sign that we use. <laughs> I just wondered if it was two different names for the same location. No, I don't know why it was called both, because, uh, as I say, there was no sign there yeah. other than the one that fell down right. uh, when I was working. And I, I never have seen a sign that said Reynoldsville Summit, but we called it that. Yeah. What else? Oh, during the war period, wasn't there a serious derailment on the westbound side of the bridge yeah, for the too. oil train derailed the foot of the south Oh, yeah, I've pictures of it. I can't answer that specifically. Of course, that was long before I was working here. Uh, I know the, there was, it was a major wreck where they, it was one of the 3200s uh, that got fire and so on. That might be what to talk about. That was west of the bridge. But but I don't have any specifics out of it. Do you, you with Tom have it? Yeah, I, I've seen photographs of that wreck. It, yeah, it did involve one of the L1s. Yes, which uh, was incinerated. Yeah, that as it was incinerated. L one was the <laughs> ten driver. It was a uh, it was a eastbound oil train. Yeah, that's why that's why the there's war. so much fire. But I don't know other specifics on it. There is a website on Federal Railroad Administration wreck reports, and you could probably if you go online, you could probably find that wreck. Uh, but I don't even have an exact date for it. Yeah, at home I'd have it. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? All right, we'll turn it over to the esteemed agent, the only guy who actually worked here. <laughs> no questions for me. That's great. <laughs> I got one. I got one. Come on. This guy's got a thousand of them. <laughs> over on the far side corner of the station here, facing the tracks, there used to be a wooden box that was attached to the wall on the corner. Do you have any idea what that box, it had like double doors on the top where you, it opened up to put paperwork and stuff in it? Do you know what it, that box know, was it, used it, for? It's possible, and, and Peter Jack may know, it, it might have been, it might have been like a conductor's box or where for they- For way bills where, and stuff right, like that? exactly. Yeah, because yeah, it shows up in some of the photographs. Uh, it was still there during the Conrail era. I don't, and I then, then personally, the box disappeared. I personally don't ever remember putting any paperwork in there because the conductor, again, I dealt just with NX9. He would just come into the building and, you know, we'd talk and, and exchange paperwork or whatever. What's that, Pete? Yeah, it's possible that, that, you know, it was something left for the any, any crew that came through here that was going to switch at night. Or something like that. Pick up cars or leave cars when, right. the, when the depot was closed. Right. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah. Now, you made references to NX-9. Uh, I used to ride with the train crew on NX-9 during the Penn Central era. Uh, at that time, NX-9 was based out of Maybrook. Was it always based out of Maybrook? No. When I when I was here, it was based out of Poughkeepsie. Out of Poughkeepsie. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and, during uh, Penn you probably worked it out, of, out of Poughkeepsie. Out of yeah, the time when I used to ride with those guys, uh, it was a Monday through Friday job based out of Maybrook. And the day of the Poughkeepsie Bridge fire, uh, they never made it back to Maybrook that day. They, they were stuck in Poughkeepsie. Any other questions? I must yes, say, sir. I came here in the beginning when Mr. Rutberg and company decided to do this. I took one look at it, like many other people, and said, you guys are nuts. See you later. <laughs> and I have to commend them for the beautiful project they, they brought forward to this community. And being at the beginning or the end of the rail trail as it is, is it speaks of the, the, the work that these gentlemen and ladies put into this building and how wonderful it is. It's a great piece of, of history that's being preserved. It's phenomenal work that you guys have done, really. You should be all proud of yourself. Because I truly, I mean, you know, when you think about it, you got the rail trail here, but the rail trail, I don't remember the rail trail being here until you started working on the depot. And I may be wrong. Uh, it was the depot, was, I believe, was almost finished by the time the rail trail got established, if I'm correct. We'll let Dave answer that. Actually, it was somewhat the other way around. Um, 
Bernie Rudberg and a group of people spent a long time trying to get together and work hard to restore, resurrect the depot. Um, they recognized that it was really the center of Hopewell Junction. It was the reason Hopewell Junction became Hopewell Junction before that it was just Hopewell. But when they were building the rail trail, Bernie suddenly got a letter in the mail from the county executive and he said basically you got two days to get that building going and we're going to tear it down because it's an eyesore, it's a safety hazard, it's a real problem. And you got a hold of Rich Taylor and a few other volunteers here and they put together a real quick plan, took it up to the county executive and uh, sold them on the idea that they could in fact restore the rail trail and started going full speed ahead uh, to fix it. And so just about the time the trail was finished, the depot was finished more or less. And kept it going. And it, since then it's expanded. I guess, you know, another commercial interruption. It's, it's an all volunteer organization. We rely on donations from the public and, and people and interested parties. We've got the, not only the museum room here and the waiting room, the signal tower we're working on, we're still looking to finish. We're planning on building a pavilion in Bernie's name. It'll be a picnic lunch pavilion so we can bring in more students, more school people, um, families into the area and really make this a, a depot park. Ultimately, we'd like to put in some rolling stock. It will probably only roll 10 feet, <laughs> if at all. But it, you know, really preserve the history of railroading in Hopewell Junction. One more thing, two more things. You want Dave or you want me? <laughs> oh, everybody. Um, I left this thinking that this was a disaster, which as just, Dave just pointed out, it was. I put my attention towards the Historical Society over on Kensington and Palin Road. And I've been very active over there, doing things over there, which is the other part of the history of this town. It's very important that we maintain the history. I think next week we're going to have an, uh, an open house over there again. Um, the other thing is, I'm a proud member of the Rotary Club, who supports this place financially, as they do the the, Ro the uh, Historical Society as well. We're very happy to do that every year to help the financial end of this project keep going along for years to come. And, and thank you. The, the town also supports us. We get, I guess, support from the county in terms of this is county property. Our construction projects, our building is all supported by them, uh, giving us the permission to go forward. So we have tremendous community support. They've all seen the value of it, not just as a, a museum, but as a destination to support this end of the rail trail. And, and Keep all of this alive. Don't see any more questions. Oh. This fellow right over here. Wasn't there a working closet on the inside of the building? Like, you know, the the thing that I remember about the building here is that there was a there was a working office in here. We obviously had the telephones and this kind of stuff. The safe that's in there, I do not remember that safe. I thought there was a much larger safe in this building when I was here in 68. Again, I, you know, it's 50 years. I'm taxing my brain a little bit, but I do not believe that's the original safe. No, it wasn't here during the That isn't the Yeah, I don't remember seeing a safe in there. It was a relatively, it was a relatively small working space. There were signal maintainers in part of this building. They had uh, uh, signal supplies and that kind of stuff in part of the building, in, 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 in that part of, in the part of the building as well. Uh, on this end of the building, seems to me there used to be a sliding door and a ramp that came up. Do you remember that? I do not remember a sliding door on it. Again, you know, 68. When I drove in here, you know, you were here early in the morning and got out of here as fast as I could in the afternoon. <laughs> well, I bought many truckloads or carloads of feed from the off at railroad, and uh, I bought a silo, got shipped in. 
of the railroad, and uh, I can remember the line that came down 82. And uh, my father we used to store apples in LaGrangeville in a cooler, and I'd try to get him to, to race the train coming down the truck on 82. Yes, sir. I've got a question for all of you. Anybody ever put cars in that IBM switch, that long siding that went over? Oh, yeah. Did you put cars IBM in there? get a lot of cars down there. Did they go to IBM or? IBM. Yeah. All the way up there. Yeah, yeah, quite a push in there. There was a runaround yeah, track in there. Not only once, but I was there. Would you have to shove them in and then come back out, or was there a runaround? There was a runaround track I down there. I did. Yeah, I'm not saying there was never a runaround. It was, I it was all later. The way where was my camera? Yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but I did do it, sir. Thank you. The the IBM siding did have a runaround track later during Penn Central in Conrail. Well, as I said before, I wasn't there yeah. all the years. Down across Route 50, the Route 52 crossing. That's all I can yeah. remember. And I, I got one more question for Pete and Jack. Uh, what is the current status of the Maybrook line from Danbury to Derby Junction? It's used constantly every day, five days a week. Really? By uh, Housatonic River, yeah. they come down. All the way to Derby Junction? Berkshire Junction. Derby, no, from Danbury oh, to Derby no, Junction. Forget it. Well, Derby Junction to Botford, forget it. Yeah, because there's... Botford, there's a lumber company, interstate, they get about two cars a week. Mm -hmm. So they don't get to Botford about two days a week, but the lumber company unloads 100 cars in Hollyville, transfer. From Botford down, forget it under who's the Right, that's, that's the way it looked the last time I saw it about three months ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, they did go down a month ago with a side dump car because Derby complained to them about a washout going on the street. Nobody knew about it, no folks, but forget it. Yeah. If you want to give uh, Lusitonic Railroad $400 million, we'll be very happy to do it. Don't have it. Well, forget <laughs> it. Same as over here. Say, I don't see any mirror. Yeah, there's no there's no freight customers past Botsford. There's nothing. So, yeah. It's okay. bad. I, and I know at one point Metro North put out a request for proposals for to do something with this line from Danbury all the, all the way to Beacon. Danbury yeah. to Beacon, yeah. but I, I don't know where that uh, where that stands. Yeah, there was never anything in the papers around here if anybody submitted any proposals right. for anything. Right. Yeah. You can read a lot of commitments, but there's no air in them. <laughs> yeah. I was at the Milford last week for two state for two state representatives to talk about uh, commuter service in the Milford to New York and all the blah blah blah. It is exactly what it was, blah yeah. blah blah. Uh, Lucy Tonic stated a, a couple of months ago. They could have a million riders a year between Pittsfield and New York. For Christ's sakes, the New Haven would still be here. But I see very little. First of all, Connecticut has no money. We're broke. Secondly, all, they're talking about, figuring about 50 to 60 riders out of the Milford. Fine. 45 to 50 come off the Harlem line. So you're not gaining anything. So forget it could happen, I'm not, but the way they're going about it, completely the wrong angle. And, but I will say this, the Hoosie Tonic got $19 million to sell their line to Massachusetts. He's a better con man than Trump. <laughs> <laughs> the Maybrook line from Danbury to Derby Junction, the right-of-way is owned by the state of Connecticut. No, Am I uh, wrong or right on that? You say Danbury to Derby Junction, right? owned by the Hoosie. It's the right away is owned by the Connecticut Hoosier. owns uh, uh, Nestle's up to below Canaan, Connecticut, uh, and then the Massachusetts owns uh, all the Massachusetts. Now, John still owns it. Uh, P&W has been trying to get running over there. Metro wants them off the uh, Danbury line. But John says there's absolutely no problem. You pay for it. Yeah. And that was the end because Connecticut's broke. Yeah, Metro North wants the stone trains off the Danbury branch. They run it branch. off the uh, Danbury line. Danbury branch, yeah. uh, They put a 25 mile an hour speed limit on it because, well, it, it isn't in their way, but 
there's no need for it to go there if they open up the Derby. So I, but Metronor says we're not going to pay. Connecticut says we're not going to pay. Traprot says we're not going to pay. So forget it. <laughs> anything else you got? Anything else that's half full, Pete? <laughs> Any more questions? That's it. Thanks very much, folks. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, Jack, Pete, Tom, for taking the time to spend with us. If you haven't been into the depot recently, there's been a few changes. If you've given direction on where to stand. Uh, if you'd like to take a tour, uh, see what's new, you're welcome to. We'll open it back up. To the gentleman off to my left, he asked about the sliding doors. We have photos of those sliding doors in there with the ramp to it, so there definitely was. I don't know the time frame, but I'm confident we've got photos that are probably dated that show that. So um, appreciate your remembrances of, of the history of the depot in that sense. So again, if there's nothing else for anyone else, again, appreciate you coming. Pass the word, let your family and friends know about it, and we'd love to have you back at any time. Thank you.